Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I wanted to start with different words, but when I look at you, I just want to say that, baby, I've been here before. I've seen this room. I've walked this floor, but the r this room was never so full. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I come from a home that was always full of music. Both my parents played the guitar and they sang, and my mother would actually sing all the time. Regardless of where she was, what she was doing, she always had the right repertoire. Like, when she was struck by the sudden spell of sadness, she would sing her favorite poems. Uh, when she was at a party, she would sing dirty songs, and I mean really dirty songs. Uh, when washing dishes, she sang battle hymns. In the mid-1980s, when Dire Straits released their Brothers in Arms album, my father, on his payday, he rushed to the only record... There was only one record shop in the city at that time, so he rushed there and he bought the vinyl and he spent half, I mean literally half, his salary on the vinyl. Uh, my uncle, on the other hand, who was only 16 when I was born, uh, he had this brilliant babysitting idea. Whenever I started to cry, he would play some music to lull me to sleep. Lullabies, you know by Judas Priest or Motorhead. <laughs> Maximum volume, right? So now that I think about it, well, maybe he really wanted to generate a source of noise louder than myself, or in simpler terms, to make me shut up, right? <laughs> and it worked, I did shut up, and I gave him a broad, toothless smile whenever the music played, and I cried again when it stopped, so it never stopped, not when he was around. Um, so when I think about it today, I realize that music and maybe a little, of, a little bit of food and attention is all I ever needed to be happy. So when one day uh, a friend's father asked the nine-year-old me the classic adult question, who do you want to be when you grow up? Without a moment of hesitation, I replied, a singer. How do you normally react to a child's dream? That guy said, you will never sing, you have polyps in your nose. Well, those weren't polyps, sir. There was sinusitis, it's perfectly curable. But at that time, I didn't know it, and I was left there with a broken dream. Apart from music, there was another obsession in my family home, language. It was an obsession to the point where my mother would actually refuse to answer my questions until they were grammatically correct. Uh, it could have had two effects. I could either hate it for the rest of my life, or I could become as obsessed about it as my mom was. And those of you who have been my students, you sure know this is what happened. <laughs> Disqualified as a potential musician, I chose the career of a linguist, only to discover that I didn't actually move too far away from my original choice of a life path. Because what else is speaking, if not singing, just without the background music? Thank you. It's good to have some technical support around, thank you. Can you please click play? So what else is speaking, if not singing, just without the background music? Uh, music and language overlap in many ways. They are both primarily manifested as sounds, and those sounds have a pitch, a melody, a rhythm, and they can be represented in writing. You can take a graphic representation of music like this one, and translate it into sound. So you take one system of signs, in this case being notes, and translate it or express it by means of another system, in this case corresponding sounds. I call it translation because in translatology this is actually called intersemiotic translation. Thank you. Uh, generative grammar uh, is one of the areas in which 
uh, language and music meet as well, but not the only area because the world of academics, the world of science knows everything about these connections already. Um, so music theory is sometimes used in linguistic analysis. Linguistics is sometimes used in musicology and ethnomusicology. There is even a field called musical linguistics, which literally puts the two things together. But generative grammar is the one I wanted to focus on uh, right now. Generative grammar is the concept that if we know the rules of grammar and we apply them, we can create numerous combinations of utterances in a given language. And some generativists believe that it applies to music as well, and here is why. Uh, in language, there are phonemes, or sounds, and morphemes, so the smallest units of meaning. Their musical equivalent are notes. That was a note. <laughs> That's a very talented pianist. <laughs> phonemes, or morphemes, are combined into words, and notes are combined into sequences or chords. That's a great talent, I told you. Uh, then syntax comes in. Words are the building blocks of sentences, and sequences or chords are used to create melodies, um, phrases, harmony lines. And then sentences are brought together to tell stories, uh, and melodies, phrases, and harmony lines are brought together to create songs. But songs are also nothing but stories, and here's the proof. Even if you hear a melody for the first time in your life, you will know if the story it tells you is still disturbingly half untold or safely and serenely over. Won't you? The generative potential uh, of both language and music is infinite, which means that we will always be coming up with or coming across sentences or melodies that we have never heard before. So many books still waiting to be written, and so many songs still waiting to be sung. Of course, there is the infinite monkey theorem, which assumes that if you let a monkey hit typewriter keys at random for eternity, at some point it will surely type any given text, for example, the complete works of William Shakespeare. So if you leave a monkey with a piano for eternity, at some point it will almost surely play any given work of music, for example, the complete works of Eric Satie. But I guess no one of us here has an eternity to spend waiting and it might be a little hard to find a monkey so involved so we can safely assume that the concept of infinite possibilities is valid. So I told you about the um, structural and about the systemic areas in which music and language overlap but most of all, most importantly, both these systems are used to tell stories and both are subject to interpretation. In language, this is called language pragmatics, some of you <laughs> have heard about it before. Uh, language pragmatics is the science of explaining you why what you say, what you mean and what other people hear are usually three different things. You've all been there, haven't you? Like how many times in your life have you said, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And how many times in your life you said, okay, that's, that's okay, when you meant that is not okay. And if you say another word, you will find out what I really think. <laughs> yeah? In music, there is even more space for interpretation because for example, with this piece of music, we will agree that it means something probably even agree that it means something else than the version or translation you heard several minutes ago. But what exactly is this meaning? Can you describe it? Can you put it in definite terms? Is it moonlight reflecting in the ripples of a lake? Is it a dance with your loved one, the moon being the only witness? Is it a childhood memory, perhaps? Or is it just pure sound? May it be 200 different things for 200 people, I guess, in this room? Your interpretation of music will depend on things like your personal experience, your emotional state, your cultural background, and other things, and numerous things for that matter. Uh, music can also be used for conversation. 
And fMRI scans show that uh, jazz musicians involved in spontaneous improvisation activate, activate exactly the same brain areas which are used for processing spoken language and syntax. And if you've ever heard a live call and response session, you know that it's true, that it really is the piano talking with the bass and the drums exchanging gossip with the saxophone. They will talk Share moments and thoughts They might even fall in Love So there was a sample call and response uh, thing <laughs> Thank you uh, music can some, uh, sometimes substitute speech, thus aiding, for example, stroke recovery. Patients who have lost their ability to speak can sometimes be taught to uh, sing instead. Stammering patients can be taught to sing their way around their speech production barrier. On the other hand, people with congenital amusia, so tone deafness, may have difficulty uh, understanding or identifying speech intonation patterns. So they might have a difficulty telling the difference between a question and a statement. Oh, by the way, by a show of hands, how many of you think you have no ear for music? Okay, and how many of you, now the good question, how many of you think you can't sing? <laughs> all right, all right, Th that's more or less what I expected. So let me show you one thing, okay? Um, how many sentences do you see on this slide? That's a, not, not a tricky question, that's an easy question. How many utterances are there on this slide? One. All right. But when I say, you are going with us, that's confirming, right? And when I say, you are going with us, that's more like reprimanding. And when I say, you are going with us, am I not actually expressing surprise with a slightly negative undertone? So how did you know it? I uttered exactly the same phrase three times. The only thing that changed was the intonation, or as you may prefer to call it, the melody of the text. So from, you are going with us, we went to, you are going with us. And to, you are going with us? Speaking is singing, just without the background music. Still think you have no ear for music? How about no trained ear for music? How many months did, you, did your parents have to wait before you started speaking? 12, 13, 14, something like that, yeah? And before you started to write, how many months did you have to train? And how many hours, now think about it, how many hours in your entire life have you spent training your ear? Actively, consciously training your ear. Not that many, right? So the ability is there, it is yours to take, just reach out and do it and give it a try and a little bit of patience. And that's called adaptation and there will be a talk about it later today. Uh, but, moving on. Uh, I started talking about pitch or intonation. And pitch on the, or intonation is an element of what in linguistic th uh, theory we call uh, the prosody of the language. So it's the melody uh, of a text, yeah? And intonation is something you produce and interpret unconsciously. Um, you don't give it too much thought, if any, for that matter, like with the three uh, examples before, unless you are a prosody maniac like me one who will read each Facebook post a hundred times to get the melody right before she publishes it. Prosody is what makes the speeches of Barack Obama or Martin Luther King so remarkable. When you hear them talk, it's almost if, as if they were singing. Or maybe they really are. Their pitch goes up and down again and it repeats, repeats, repeats to keep you all attentive. And they will have verses in their stories. And there will be a chorus like, I have a dream, or a simple, yes we can all sung, not spoken, just by means of intonation. Another element of prosody is stress. If prosody is the melody of the text, stress will determine its rhythm. It can change the meaning of a whole sentence, but also of a single word, like the noun dessert, thank you, uh, if you stress it differently, will become a verb, desert, right? 
the next element is volume, and volume is a common tool used to express emotion. So the more excited or the angrier you are, the louder you will probably speak. But when you want to confess love to someone, you will probably whisper it to their ear, right? And volume is also used in songs, because how do you sing a lullaby? Like this? Take it easy, child, don't cry Let me hold your hand and let me stroke your hair Or like this Sleep well Sleep well I promise I'll never hurt you again Thank you. So which one tells you a more convincing story? I guess the answer is rather obvious, yeah? Another element of prosody is the speed of speech. So some of us will s naturally speak faster or slower than others, and then it's an element of our individual language or idiolect. But you can also consciously alter the speed at which you're speaking, slowing down to emphasize something, or speeding up when you want to get your audience excited about an idea. In songs, you will use short one-syllable words for action, change, dynamics, and longer, more flowing ones to let your audience dive into images of love, melancholy, or reflection. Uh, and last, but not least, pause. Silence. Silence is also language. Silence expresses meaning. You will pause to let a thought sink in. And you will pause to enhance the importance of the words you are about to say. You will understand another person's silence when they offer it to you, no matter how implicitly. Good or bad. Delightful or heartbreaking. I hear your silence loud and clear. In every word you say In every curse you whisper In a smile that becomes a sneer And this song was actually born in a language pragmatics class. John, are you here? Hello. Thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> Silence expresses the inexpressible, and as Aldous Huxley once beautifully stated, after silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. Um, the emotional tone of music and language uh, will be usually in line with one another to bring harmony into the meaning. Like in this song, there is an optimistic, hopeful part. <coughs> Trust me when I say The universe is on your side And then something changes, deepens, makes you more alert And if you don't trust in God's And that's not only something that happens on the lyrics level It's also when a D major, so a happy chord Changes into F sharp minor, a sad one so with words and music, you tell a complementary story. You tell a story, because both music and language are tools of storytelling. With language, it's self-explanatory, right? But with music and not a single word, you can tell a story of joy. Of sadness. Of fear. of love. Of grief. Of creepiness. Or the fact that I don't care about something anymore so much 
that it actually brings a sweet smile to my face. And when you see this verse, you will expect something to complement the meaning. You will expect a bright and calm melody to emphasize the confession of love, right? But if we do this, Today, I'll give you everything. I'll sing of love into your ear till it sends shivers down your neck. Then I'll wrap you, honey, in a sudden of my kiss. I will feed you with my sweetest fruit. I will swing you in my heart till you fall asleep. Do you still think the story has a happy ending? <laughs> Here, the information smuggled through music is more important than the words you hear. You feel the dissonance, you know something is wrong here, and when you hear it, you're, you know you're not actually looking at a blushing cheeks situation, but at a shattered heart situation. Yeah? I once heard a saying that talking about music is like dancing about architecture. But what if we consider talking itself as an act of music creation? And what if we consider music as an act of storytelling? Can you play me a story? Can you perhaps tell me your life with a single song? Can you sing the words of confessions, of memories? of talks. One more thing before we go. If a little girl tells you one day she wants to sing her love away don't tell her she can't that it's impossible don't, don't tell her, not because you'll hurt her, but because you never know, not because you'll break her. You just never know. You are all musicians. Keep singing. <laughs>